just a quick word about um, what what is URBC? What is it all about? Um, so the purpose here to collaboratively foster place-based strategies to proactively reduce risk, enhance resilience, and improve disaster recovery pathways in BC. And we do this by bringing people together, people such as yourselves, um, across the science policy action interface and fostering dialogue um, to make these strategies possible and to advance them. Um, specifically with regards to this session and seismic policy for existing buildings, um, I think strong connections here exist to both uh, the EPA modernization that's ongoing right now, the province. So there's uh, emergency management legislation that's currently being updated. Um, and part of that update reflects um, the need and the desire to shift our focus from a responsive mode to a more proactive risk reduction approach. Um, also, this connects to um, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is a global framework for disaster risk reduction to which um, BC and Canada are signatories. Many of these initiative and focus sessions, as we have today, are effectively implementing Sendai in British Columbia. Um, so two strong connections there um, to both <clears throat> provincial and federal initiatives. I believe I'll pass it over now to Micah. Our session is called Seismic Risk Reduction for Buildings a conversation about options and, and actions. And honestly, it's a fairly good title because like that's what we're doing. Um, the idea is to provide you with the legislative context, the regulatory context um, for the province um, and really understand that and understand how that actually comes into action with um, things like the existing building strategy with which they're currently working on and the, size, the expansion of the seismic retrofit guidelines. And then I will be presenting um, from the city of Vancouver's perspective, um, what that means in terms of coming up with a comprehensive action towards seismic risk reduction for buildings. Um, and that's, that's really what we're all here uh, to think about is how can we reduce risk to earthquakes and how can we reduce risk to, um, to earthquakes specifically in the space of existing buildings. Um, so we're gonna present um, three presentations laid out pretty much as I just described. Can we regulate the BC building code? Um, Queen's Printer does the publishing and as you as you may know actually as of last year the, build, the BC Building Code is free for all British Columbians to access as is the National Building Code and and we work I'll just be really clear we we share responsibility with the local governments so local governments and uh, what are called registered professionals there's kind of the three legs of the the stool for the BC's building regulatory system all have a role. Local governments through building bylaws uh, implement uh, the BC building code and Vancouver is a charter city, so they have their own building code um, under the Vancouver building bylaw. And uh, registered professionals, which includes architects and engineers, uh, provide assurance for compliance with the code for what we call complex buildings. So the code is considered the minimum acceptable standard, uh, prescribed practices to achieving specific uh, standard of living. And, and it, it falls into kind of seven broad categories of, of objectives. So there's health, health of occupants, including indoor air quality and comfort. There's the safety of occupants. Uh, there's fire protection and structural protection of the building. Uh, so kind of transcending beyond the occupants to the actual physical structure that it will withstand uh, extreme wind events or a seismic event. Um, accessibility for people with disabilities and energy and water efficiency. And since uh, 1974, BC has had a code uh, the National Code was originally published in 1941. Um, you know, one of the, the challenges uh, with the, uh, the code is uh, kind of the responsiveness to evolving conditions. And in fact, even the seismic standards are evolving. In uh, 2010, National Building Code, there was a certain set of assumptions with respect to the seismic risk. Uh, and then in 2015, when, it, when the revised code nationally was published, those assumptions changed such that the, the strength of, of buildings needed to increase dramatically, the so-called ground motion, ground design motion. 
or sorry, design ground motion. Um, in other words, how strong of an event, an, a seismic event in my location do I need to design my building to withstand? And in 2020, those standards are gonna change once again. Uh, there's also limited ability to address unique local conditions and needs such as slope stability and, and liquefaction, although the code does have some provisions in that regard. But a lot of responsibility sits with the, the local government building official and the, the registered professionals who, who sign off on buildings locally. And the code does not consider impacts of enforcement or enable measurable outcomes. Um, so there's a few challenges, and that's why we, we do regard um, the issue of building standards as it relates to seismic safety, for example, and structural integrity to be a, a partnership among multiple uh, parties. Uh, and, and what we strive to do over time is transform the market uh, so that eventually the entire building stock uh, meets the performance standards uh, that we're, we're striving for. And, and for earthquake safety, it's, it's actually to withstand the one in 2,500 year event or 2,475 year event, which is a, a major um, subduction earthquake as, as British Columbia experienced in the year 1700. And in order to get there, uh, on the bottom left, we need to do risk assessment and education with some government leadership. And Kylie, after me, is going to talk about some government leadership areas with respect to schools, uh, capacity building, such as today's event, incentives. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a California-style incentive where homeowners could, could receive a rebate from their insurance provider to, to bolt their wood frame building into the foundation. And so that does exist in California. Financing, um, equipment standards, what I'm referring to here is uh, when you know, individual equipment like boilers or furnaces are replaced, that there are certain standards to reduce uh, risk uh, as they're being replaced. Local regulations and, and the BC Building Code. And I guess the idea is that 85% you know, of the effort occurs prior to something coming into code um, and uh, over time. And so we're tackling this issue of how do we, how do we address existing buildings? And this is, uh, shows you the diversity of regulatory options for British Columbian uh, authorities. And over on the far left is an example of those standards that apply equally in all parts of the province and, and where we're fundamentally um, you know, nationalizing the, the development of standards and for seismic safety. Actually, I don't think you're you're seeing my cursor here. So I'm in the the second um, column here, where let's say that our codes were identical to the National Building Code exclusively. So that's national harmonization. The third column from the left focuses on BC exceptions to the code. And we haven't done that with, with seismic, but we could theoretically if there were aspects of the national code that didn't address uh, BC uh, conditions. And in the middle area, that's where we share jurisdiction with local governments. And we're trying to reduce the amount of inconsistency. So um, for 12 story mass timber, We've allowed 12-story encapsulated mass timber in 13 communities in BC. So that's the fourth column from the left where it's a jurisdictional regulation. Uh, we also allow for some alternative solutions where the, the engineer or architect put forward uh, alternative designs. And then we get into more of a focus on local authority leadership. And I think in other, for other risk aspects like floodplain, related considerations or uh, forest fire interface zone considerations. Those are very local issues. And we have done what's called an unrestriction where the local government has essentially jurisdiction to regulate in that space. And the BC Building Code does not do that. Uh, National Building Code is developed by all of these, um, that by this institutional framework starting at the very top 
in the middle, the Canadian Commission on Building and Fire Codes, that, that blue box. On the left, the Provincial and Territorial Policy Advisory Committee on Codes, where we provide our input on priorities. And about three weeks ago, I sent a letter to PTPAC requesting the development of an alterate, uh, a building code for alterations to existing buildings and highlighted the need to address um, seismic as, as an early um, goal uh, with respect to the National Building Code. And then underneath the CCBFC, you see all of the committees, the standing committees, and you can see one, uh, the list is over on the right called Earthquake Design. Um, that uh, allows for a focus on the issue that we're talking about today. I'm going to pass the uh, microphone over to Kylie to tell us about a uh, development of a strategy for alterations to existing buildings. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the alterations to existing buildings project, which Andrew has referenced. And uh, exactly, then I'm going to drill down a little bit from that project to a sub project uh, within that on exist exactly how we're looking at developing technical requirements for existing buildings as it relates to seismic risk reduction and resilience in the built environment. So what's the current context on existing buildings in BC? So the, the BC Building Code is intended primarily for new construction and it's designed to apply at the time of construction, whereas for existing buildings, although the BC Building Code does apply to existing buildings, it's not, it's not designed with them in mind. And so, and it applies at, at the time of renovation. And so we have a situation where the requirements can sometimes be unclear and inconsistently interpreted by building officials, uh, by local governments or by, by builders themselves. And quite honestly, within our office as well, um, as to how these requirements apply to buildings, just given the, the variability of the existing building stock. Um, so that's the situation that we find ourselves when, and with meeting future obje objectives such as resiliency, we know that in the future, uh, in 2030, over 70% of the buildings that will exist then have already been built and many before modern standards. So we have some, some work to do in addressing the existing building stock. Next slide, please. So our alterations to existing buildings projects aim, uh, it's a, a mandate under Clean BC uh, for BSSB to adopt and the government to adopt a code for alterations to existing buildings by 2024 that addresses water or energy uh, consumption buildings. And uh, as well as that objective, we also want to take this opportunity to address a number of other uh, objectives, um, the clarity and consistency issue, as well as the, the topic of our conversation today, which is uh, seismic resilience in buildings. The way that we're approaching this project is really as a strategy. How do we bring all of these different pieces, these, these different objectives that we want to achieve together? And that takes uh, a bit of a concerted approach and uh, uh, lots of consultation, lots of policy development in our office before we're, we're in a position to uh, develop uh, codes and standards or, or implement. So where we are right now or is in the initial policy phases, and we've completed a, a first initial phase of consultation uh, in fall 2019, which I will speak, speak a little bit to, but I just wanted to highlight how um, this really is something new in, in our office and, and also at the national code level, uh, alterations to existing buildings has not been, been uh, dealt with before. So uh, yeah, this is an exciting and challenging undertaking for us. So some of you may have been involved in the, the 2019 consultation, and I just want to highlight some of the, the key themes, particularly around code requirements. Uh, that clarity, uh, we asked stakeholders across 27 organizations we met with, across five stakeholder groups, what they wanted to see in code requirements. And we got that consistency uh, across municipalities, across the province, 
um, which only comes through clarity of, of requirements, um, but as well as practicality, flexibility, and choice for, for building owners, for municipalities, that to really account for the variability that we see in the existing building stock, and that is really necessary to help us achieve uh, the objectives that we want to achieve, such as, such as resiliency. Um, so I'm not going to go in detail over the others, um, but just as, as a point of reference here, I wanted to throw those up. Quick slide, please. So that brings me to the, the focus of this, con this conversation on uh, what are we doing about seismic? So our, in the alterations to existing building strategy, we're addressing seismic through the expansion of the seismic retrofit guidelines. So some of you may be familiar with these, but for those who are not, I'll just do a brief overview of what are the, what is the SRG. And so this is a tool, uh, requirements and a met, uh, an engineering methodology, which was developed by engineers and geoscientists of BC for the Ministry of Education, seismic, or school seismic retrofit program back in, I think, 2004. So it's a, a tried and tested uh, methodology that's been around and continuously has developed for uh, over 15 years now and has received national and international recognition for engineering excellence and uh, its performance uh, methodology. So we, we see this as something that provides several elements of what we're looking for, uh, an assessment and data collection tool for existing buildings and uh, a performance-based uh, way to design retrofits to meet a, size, a specific level of performance. So something that could be codified or elements of it could be codified in the, the building code or other regulation and has the potential to be scalable for, to the national building code for or for use elsewhere in Canada. Next slide, please. So the scope of the project is really in two phases, and it's to deal, produce technical requirements to address high risk, low rise, and mid rise existing buildings in these high hazard communities. We're in deep in phase one of the project right now, which is to create tools for 43 low rise building prototypes. And um, we're coming up on completion in uh, April, 2021. And this, this would not be possible without the support of our funding partners, NRC and NRCAN, who are also playing a, a really important uh, peer review and governance role in, in the project as well. And, and also our, our contractor and our partner, uh, EGBC, who's helping us develop, develop the technical requirements. So we hope to go forward with a, a phase two, which will address low rise buildings uh, in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the next slides in this presentation are to sort of give you a feel for how it, how it works on the ground. What does it look like in, in practice? Um, this is often the question that I get about the, the SRG. So I've endeavored in the, the next few slides to try to answer that, that uh, question of what does this look like? How does it work? So first of all, the SRG uses a three-step assessment process, which starts out with a simple question of, does this need a retrofit or not? And does that through de determining the risk level of, a, of any given building. And so if the building is determined to using on-site access, construction drawing, and analysis by the consulting engineer, um, then it will, you'll go on to the next uh, two steps, which then starts to build out the actual project, the construction scope, uh, the construction budget, and anything else that may need to be taken into account uh, in the actual construction project itself. Next slide, please. So throughout the assessment process, uh, the engineer who's working on the project would use an online uh, seismic performance analyzer tool. So this on, is an online user interface for engineers who use it to uh, understand the, the first, first of all, the, the risk of the building um, in the assessment phase, and then also use it to design the retrofit. 
um, if there is a retrofit. So first of all, they, uh, the engineer would go into this online portal and input some variables um, that they've gained from their on-site uh, analysis of the building. It includes community hazard value, soil, building prototype, and, and some other um, metrics to produce a retrofit priority ranking or risk ranking. And for the engineers who are in the audience, this is uh, PDE, probability of drift exceedance, but the rest of us can think about it as a, a risk ranking. Uh, next slide, please. So what are those risk levels? Uh, these are those risk levels. So uh, uh, it, your building will either get categorized as H1, H2, H3, which would need a retrofit or would not need a retrofit and may be assessed to um, a, a lower medium uh, definition of, of risk. So the highest uh, vulnerable structures would be, would have widespread damage or structural failure and would not be repairable after an event. And so with these risk levels um, that are gained through the online analyzer tool, um, these would be used in the design process to then design a, a retrofit um, for that specific building. Now, next slide, please. So in designing that uh, retrofit, um, in the past, engineers have used two different levels of performance to design uh, school retrofits, collapse prevention and safe shelter. So one thing or a few things, um, or one thing I'll mention is that in, in this process of assessment and how the, the seismic retrofit guidelines have been developed and used for school buildings, we have a number of, of opportunities and decision points um, which factor into our analysis now of how will these be used for privately owned buildings or non-school buildings, uh, or how could it be used in the future? And so one of these questions is, should there be other uh, performance levels? Um, do different kinds of buildings need different kinds of performance levels um, that we would wish them to be designed to? or maybe there's just another, a different gradient of, of performance that, that, we, that we're interested in having. Um, so I, I hope that I, I've laid out uh, a clear understanding of, or clear as it can be on how the seismic retrofit guidelines are used today and um, some of the possibilities for how they, they may be used in the BCDC or other regulation uh, in the future to address the steep building um, that are in the private market. Thank you. So with that, I will pass it over to Micah to talk about the uh, um, city of Vancouver. So we've heard a bit about the, the BC um, regulatory context and how all of that kind of works. And then we're hearing from Kylie about how we can think about specific programs that target um, things that we want to do. So existing buildings, how do we make a retrofit actually happen? Um, where I come in and my presentation comes in today is um, I work for the city of Vancouver. Um, I'm an urban planner and I'm trying to develop um, a policy program that means to reduce the risk um, to our 90,000 existing buildings, um, those that are privately held um, in the city of Vancouver. Um, so it's important to note, and I usually just at the end of the presentation, but given how everything is formatted a little at the beginning, this work is being done collaboratively with the province. We're in lockstep on this. This isn't some kind of rogue program or anything like that. This is meant to be how can we plug into the existing regulatory context. But a lot of the work that needs to be done um, that to support a lot of this work needs to be done at a really local and specific level to kind of pull those lessons up. So we'll talk about some of those lessons today. Um, when we think about like what are our policy options that we could use in order to reduce risk for, for, um, for existing buildings. So the program that I work on, the mandate is to de uh, develop a policy to reduce the risks we all face from earthquake prone, privately owned existing buildings. 
So that's the universe, not city buildings, not schools, not hospitals, not federal buildings, not provincial buildings, that set of buildings. Um, the ultimate goal, uh, protect life and safety and equitably reduce, and advance, uh, reduce risk and advance recovery um, for the city. It's not just enough to keep buildings standing up. We need to think about recovery. Um, and it's not just enough to sort of slam regulations down onto buildings. We need to think about how to do that equitably, considering the owners, considering the, the residents of the building um, or occupants of the building, um, considering the use of the building. So what does that actually end up meaning? Um, it means a risk assessment, policy options, an engagement process on those policy options, and then a strategy for action. So that's in a nutshell what I work on. Um, I'll show you where we are in that process in a minute, but I really want to take a, a, a second. Thank you, Andrew, for anticipating that. Um, I want to take a second just to acknowledge that this work is not being done in isolation. I don't just sit at a, sit at a desk and, you know, type things down um, or in my house as it currently is. Um, we have a seismic policy advisory committee, which is a technical working group. They're helping us think through the nuts and bolts of this um, from a technical standpoint. We will do more engagement in the future, but we needed to make sure we had our homework done first before we went out and sort of talk, started to talk to people quite broadly. And these are some of the people, NRCAN, um, UBC, ERI, um, Structural Engineers Association, the province, like all these folks are helping us to figure that out. All right, next slide. So where are we in the process? Where, where, oh, you can't see my cursor. Where were the red stars? Um, we are in between policy option development and moving out towards uh, stakeholder engagement and then policy development and implementation. The risk assessment uh, process, I, I just kind of highlight, I have to do all this in like 10 minutes and I usually do this in an hour. So um, here we go. Uh, what we have to do in order to get all of this done that you see on the screen is build a building inventory develop a specific and comprehensive assessment of our risks. It's not just enough to know that URM buildings always fall down in earthquakes. We need to know about our, U our URMs, how they're used, where they are, where's the concentration of them. How does that work for the British Columbia context as, as Andrew was talking about our unique regulatory context here in Canada and in British Columbia. We need to develop a set of policy options. And that's really where I come in. Um, my experience comes from San Francisco and having worked on a similar program there. Um, trying to think about what are all the different policy options, and most importantly, how do we match that to our data-driven approach on risk assessment? How do we go from this really big idea of, okay, we have a huge problem for earth with earthquakes, down to a more specific understanding, and then start to pair that with policy options um, so that we can actually move forward? And that's actually the exercise for later as well. Um, engage with stakeholders, kind of like what we're doing now, but like much more, you know, involved. Um, analyze those policy options further and develop a set of recommended actions. So it's about that sort of feedback loop between um, coming up with things, coming up with technical standards, and then coming back and trying to figure out how they work and you know, kind of work on them that way. Next slide. So I talked about this idea of a manageable problem. You know, at first, um, we started out basically where most cities start. Um, well, we started a little further than most cities start. Most cities start with the idea earthquakes are bad. So great, got that. Um, but what does it actually mean? How can we actually move to something that's meaningful and actionable? And risk assessment, the building inventories, these processes allow us to do that. We went from knowing that we had a general problem with earthquakes to knowing we had 90,000 buildings, about 90,000 buildings in, in the city of Vancouver, not in the province, in the city of Vancouver. And that of those 90,000 buildings, we know that most of our risk is concentrated in six types of buildings. They're typical poor performers, but there are some unexpected sort of things that have played out um, here in, uh, in Vancouver. And then we know that of those six types of buildings, not every single one of them is at risk, but we have a sense of what types of buildings are at risk. Um, we know where the risk is concentrated, um, as you see on the map here, um, West End, Downtown East Side, um, Kitsilano, Broadway Corridor, a lot of the street, uh, a lot of the major arterials are lighting up here um, on the map that shows the concentration of our, of our earthquake risk here. So this allows us to start to take that huge problem and start to make it a little bit more manageable one step at a time. Next slide. Um, I put I put the slide on the on the the the, uh, the image on the left. Uh, it's usually my first slide, uh, but I don't feel like I need to convince you guys there are earthquakes. There are people out there I need to convince there are earthquakes. There are earthquakes, um, and this is a sort of general look at at our seismicity here in in the lower mainland. And you've already gotten um, you know a sense of that from from Murray, um, so I won't go into it, but we have decided to use the planning scenario of a Georgia Strait 
magnitude 7.3 event. And the reason I'm bringing it up right now is that I'm about to tell you a bunch of numbers and I want you to know where those numbers um, link to and they're not just sort of out there. Um, so Georgia Strait magnitude 7.3. Again, the exercise takes from big problem and make it into something that we can actually apply policy to. So we know that between a third and half of Vancouver residents will be disrupted or displaced for um, a pretty serious amount of time, a couple, a few months um, in, in a very major earthquake. We know that, there, that a massive earthquake is likely to cause hundreds of um, severe casualties and injuries. Um, we know that building damage um, at a really high level um, is concentrated in just 10% of our city buildings. It isn't every single little building takes a little bit of the heart or you know, every single building is at fault um, in every single way. It's that there are certain types of buildings um, where we really start to see that concentration. Um, and we can expect upwards of $8 billion in direct financial losses. That's just uh, the direct losses, not economic and, and sort of cascading things like that. Um, we know that um, unreinforced masonry or older brick buildings um, are a big culprit. We know that older uh, multifamily wood frame buildings are also, and we know that older concrete buildings. Our older concrete buildings play out in a lot of complex ways here um, in Vancouver. They're office buildings. Um, and they're also a lot of our residential stock. We know that over, uh, or about 50% of our residents live in multifamily housing. It isn't just like everybody lives in single family homes. There's a few people that live in these larger buildings. Half of our, um, of our, of our population live in our multifamily buildings, even though um, they are less than 10% of our population of buildings. Um, Andrew's moving me along there, and which is totally fine. Um, so what do we do about this risk? Um, there are a spectrum of options. Um, as I put on this slide here, um, no one option solves us everything. We're not talking about a mandatory retrofit for every single building. We need to think really strategically and in a really targeted way. And that's why we've done risk assessment so that we can understand in a really fine grained way how our risk plays out through our use, through our buildings, through our neighborhoods um, in a way that we can apply in a really nimble way um, or um, policy um, that reduces risk. So we've got at-risk building inventory all the way here on the left. It's the least effective in terms of reducing risk and it is the least difficult. It basically is just a, a list of all the buildings that are a problem, which is different than the building inventory I talked about because that's a list of all the buildings. And then we've got building replacement all the way on the other end. That's the most effective, but the most difficult because you're actually replacing a building or replacing buildings. And then in the middle, you have kind of where we are right now, voluntary retrofit. Buildings do get retrofitted um, on, a, on a fairly regular basis here in BC and co-triggered red retrofits. And we think about part 11 of the building code in Vancouver, um, where you come in to do a bunch of new work to your building. We're gonna ask you, we're gonna work with you um, to make sure that you can do some seismic upgrades to the building. And we get buildings upgraded in that way as well. Um, I really wanted to show here that there are a spectrum of options, um, sort of least effective um, to most effective, least difficult to most difficult. Um, but there are key considerations when we consider policy. Um, tenant displacement, um, tenant and occupants disruption as well. Um, cost financing, cost pass-throughs, where the capital improvement cost can actually be passed along to the tenants in a very regulated manner. That's something that San Francisco um, had quite a bit of. Um, 30, I have 30 seconds left. Um, and uh, phasing uh, the upgrades, uh, program timing, uh, I'm now re reading from the slide because I've run out of time, but there are a lot of um, considerations that we need to take into, in, into consideration when we're thinking about um, policy. It isn't just sort of the abstract and singular goal of reducing risk. We need to think about um, how the buildings are used today and what that's going to mean in an earthquake later and then really balance that when we're thinking about policy. And the last thing, and I hope this is my last slide, um, the resilient buildings concept on the right. Oh man, uh, we, um, we need to think about the whole building. Um, we need to think about our existing buildings as a set of, of problems that we need to approach. We need to approach all of the challenges within that building. That's really resilient building context. These are, uh, this is more detail on the um, policy options. Uh, so the city of Seattle has done an inventory of their unreinforced masonry buildings. The city of San Francisco did a mandated evaluation program. Next slide. Um, the city of San Francisco did a mandated retrofit on soft story buildings, which are those older wood frame buildings that I talked about before. Mandated retrofit and replacement, that's Los Angeles' strategy to soft story. 
Um, and then we have land use based uh, tools um, here in Vancouver. What could those be? Um, that's, that's really one of the open questions for today. And then that gets us into our, um, our exercise. We have two questions. One is, um, what are the actions that government could or should take to effectively and feasibly reduce seismic risk for your cohort of buildings? So in your breakup group, you're working on murder or whatever it is. And what are the unique challenges to these options? So this is really a brainstorming activity and really thinking about for MERBs, for example, multi-unit um, multi residential buildings, what are the sort of unique solutions that we could come up with? Um, prepare a list of those policy options and then consider them in terms of effective, effectiveness, feasibility, and key impediments. Um, and then the next question is, sort of a similar question, but taking that list and trying to think what are the supporting actions that can make that actually happen um, for, uh, for your cohort of buildings. So for example, for MERBs, um, a lot of things that we hear people talking about is there's gonna be any upgrade program to them at all. We need to consider um, a way of protecting the tenants about facilitating the pass through. Um, so really figuring out a new way of managing that relationship or, or you know, a heightened way of managing that relationship between owner and occupant. So that could be an example of a, um, a facilitating action in, um, in question two. So that's, that's the work for today. And I think we have about 50 minutes to do it. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank again, uh, the presenters, the conveners, Micah and Andrew uh, being the conveners and Kylie who also graciously contributed her time um, and thank you to everybody for joining. I'm excited to actually sit and uh, review the comments from the chat once they're exported. Um, so thank you for all the, the time and contribution there. Um, I did already mention the upcoming sessions. Um, so immediately next week, we have um, a session with Steve Litke and Francis Wu from the Fraser Basin Council, uh, who will be chatting similar to this with regards to their initiative which is the regional flood strategy for the Lower Mainland uh, and seeking your input on that, as well as the first dialogue session on low carbon resilient buildings, uh, which will build off uh, a lot of the topics um, that we're exploring today. I think uh, hopefully, um, yeah, build off, build off the good discussion here, talk about some of the tensions and incentives to improving uh, the buildings that we have, existing buildings and new buildings. So that'll be a great dialogue session. It's our version of a keynote panel, basically. Um, so really short presentations up front, like three minutes um, with lots of time for Q&A and dialogue. Um, so with that, I think I will, uh, I will let us all get on here uh, 10 minutes early. And thanks so much for joining.